Hello everyone, welcome back to the Trumpet Daily. As a radical Sunni movement cuts a violent path toward Baghdad, Iran is stepping forward to save its neighbor, and presumably with the full support of the United States. The closer ISIS gets to the Iraqi capital and the sacred Shiite shrine of the Mosque of the Golden Dome in the city of Samarra, the more likely Iran will feel that it has no choice but to intervene. That's from Time Magazine this past week. Iran has no choice. What an unbelievable turn of events we are witnessing in Iraq today. Our forces will do whatever it takes to protect the border and the holy shrines from this bunch of thugs. That's a statement from a former high-ranking Iranian diplomat. And meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said just this week that the U.S. is open to discussions with Iran about Iranian intervention in Iraq. So America now seems poised and ready to offer military assistance to Iran, a scenario that would have been unthinkable even last week. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. And he said unto me, you must prophesy again. Last week we taped a program on the post-American Middle East. I'd encourage you to go back and look at that just to get the bigger picture of uh, these developments in uh, Iraq this week. It's been all over the news. You've seen about it on, on uh, programs and, and probably read about it to some extent. Uh, last week, I guess it was Friday, the president came out uh, and said that there would be no troops uh, sent to Iraq this time and then he went off on a vacation over the weekend and the, that weekend turned out to be just a brutal weekend for the people uh, of Iraq. A, a story in the New York Times on Monday uh, spoke of these mass slaughters and executions and beheadings that uh, the Sunni movement uh, was carrying out on its march through Iraq. Just a brutal weekend as I, as I said. This uh, leader of the ISIS movement there, uh, an individual by the name of, of Baghdadi, I mean, he has an interesting background. If you go back and look at some of the history with him, he was actually captured uh, in Iraq by U.S. forces back in 2005 and put in detention or in captivity there at Camp Bucca, held there for several years. And then uh, I guess it's a little bit murky at this point as to how he was released, but I guess as part of the, the U.S. withdrawal that was oncoming, uh, U.S. forces decided to turn him over to Iraqi forces in 2009. And then after that, he was let go and has since returned to the battlefield. And he's the one leading the Sunni charge. He's the one signing off on all of these mass beheadings He's the one carrying out these acts of revenge all ac across uh, Iraq. It's been reported just in the last week that when he was let go in 2009, he uh, reportedly said to his U.S. captors, I'll see you in New York. In other words, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And he certainly did uh, come back at least to the Iraqi battlefield to this point. Who knows where he goes from here? makes you a little bit uneasy, doesn't it, about the others that were let go just recently, the Taliban dream team that uh, the president let out of uh, Guantanamo, and the fact that they too have made statements indicating they're going to return. Reports have come out that four of the five are definitely going back to the battlefield. These are frightening developments. This is from a, a Telegraph article about this uh, Baghdadi individual. It says, why such a ferocious individual is deemed fit for release in 2009 is not no. One, one possible explanation is that he was one of thousands of suspected insurgents granted amnesty as the U.S. began its drawdown in Iraq. So, again, just like with Afghanistan, as we uh, covered a couple of weeks ago with this prisoner swap for uh, Bergdahl, the president's comments that, well, this is what happens at the end of wars, you return prisoners. 
So we did that in 2009, 2010, and so on with Iraq, and now, of course, we're in the process of doing it um, with, that, with Afghanistan. The same scenario playing out. This is a statement from Baghdadi himself. He says, soon we will face you and we are waiting for this day. That's a recent comment that he made on Sunday after carrying out all of this, this mass slaughter. He's basically picking a fight with the United States again, saying, come on over and join. Join the battle. Let's go at it. Taunting uh, the Americans. And so with all that's been in the news, of course, Western diplomats are scrambling this week, trying to figure out how they can tone down the violence, how they can restore order to Iraq, a nation that America supposedly had under control just a few years ago. And of course, they're turning, as you've probably also read, to Iran, of all nations, they're turning to Iran to solve this problem, to pick up the pieces after this collapse of uh, Iraq's government. Notice this headline here, off to the left there, from The Independent. Iraq crisis prompts reconciliation between Iran and the West. Notice it says, from great Satan to the great reproachment. <laughs> Iran used to see us as the great Satan. Of course, they still do. But this is the nation now that the United States and the UK are reaching out to. The article itself says the collapse of Iraq has led Britain and the United States towards a historic rapprochement with Iran, which could end 35 years of hostility. <laughs> Moves to strengthen Britain's diplomatic ties with Iran in an attempt to fashion a joint response to the Iraq crisis will be set out today by William Hague, the foreign secretary. It says the initiative, which could include the reopening of the UK's embassy in Tehran, comes after Mr. Haig held talks with his Iranian uh, counterpart. We can tie that in right with uh, some of the other statements, as I said at the top, uh, with Secretary Kerry saying that he's open for discussions. The State Department also this week has uh, released a statement saying that they're not ruling out going into some kind of uh, an alliance here with Iran to put down this Sunni uprising in Iraq. Now I want to take you back just six, six uh, weeks ago to a list or an update or a summary of what the State Department here in the United States itself produced about uh, terrorism. And basically from this report, I mean, it's about terrorism all over the world, but there's a, a pretty good uh, chunk of material in there on Iran. And it shows how that Iran has been working actively to undermine Iraqi stability because it works in their favor. An Iraq that's unstable is an Iraq that Iran can dominate. And so Iran's been working behind the scenes to facilitate both the Shiite and the Sunni terror activities, both of them. Now it is true that Iran is, is predominantly Shiite, and they do have a, a, an interest in protecting their Shiite brethren in Iraq. But when it works to their favor, they're certainly happy to support uh, Sunni movements like Al-Qaeda, so long as it brings down the greater enemy, which is that great Satan, the United States. This is from that State Department report. It says Iran allowed al-Qaeda facilitators to operate a core uh, facilitation pipeline through Iran, enabling AQ or al-Qaeda to move funds and fighters to South Asia and also to Syria. It says al-Fadli is a, a veteran AQ operative who has been active for years. Al Fadli began working with the Iran-based AQ facilitation network in 2009 and was later arrested by Iranian authorities. He was uh, then released in 2011 and assumed leadership of the Iran-based AQ facilitation network. The point being that here again, they've been behind um, these Sunni movements when it furthers their interest. How much is the United States being played. We've seen it happen over and over again. It's, I mean, who benefits, as I said, from the instability in uh, Iraq? Who benefits the most? The United States certainly doesn't benefit from it. The Iraqi government doesn't. 
Uh, you could argue, I suppose, that the Sunnis do, carrying out these acts of revenge. But the nation, the government that benefits from it most, is uh, Iran, across the border in Iran. Now, I don't want to just minimize entirely the, the Sunni movement and this, you know, the Saudi Arabian interest of pushing back at Iran's dominance. We've talked to you before on this very program about the divide in the Arab world. I mean, there is a real <laughs> visceral hatred between the Sunnis and the Shiites. But together, they hate the United States more. They hate Israel more. Now, along with all these prophecies that are unfolding, there is going to be a clear divide in the Arab world, in the world of Islam, that Psalm 83 alliance that we've talked to you about so many times before. But as we've also tried to help you see, Iran is taking over its neighbor, Iraq. Iran is the prophesied king of the south, spoken of in Daniel chapter 11. And we told you all along during the war against terrorism that what the United States was doing there in Iraq was just basically preparing the way for Iran to come in and take over. And that's what we're seeing happen. How about that? Fulfilled prophecy. We're seeing it happen right in front of us. I mean, really, as we said from the outset, this goes before Mr. Obama's administration. We were saying that when the war against terror started in 2001, that the, the, the nation that should have been punished the most uh, was Iran, the head of the snake. And really, that, I mean, their aggression, their hatred, their violence toward America, it's continued right up until, as I quoted from that State Department release, just weeks ago, you remember when the U.S. forces were there before they left in 2011, all the reports coming out from the CIA, from the State Department about some of these roadside bombs and, and some of the, the equipment that these terrorists had in Iraq, how that they were made in Iran, how that Iran was behind a lot of it. What strange bedfellows. And now all of a sudden you see the U.K. and you see the U.S. reaching out to the mullahs just as we reached out to Putin, of all, of all individuals, last year with respect to uh, Syria. Look, the mullahs have always understood that an unstable Iraq, it, it suits their interest. They've always understood that if Iraq is unstable, they can dominate Iraq. They can dominate their neighbor. But you have to wonder if even they if even they thought that after all of these developments, the United States would come knocking on their door to solve the problem, quote unquote. Let's look at Leviticus 26. We wrote early on, as I've mentioned before, how that as this war against terror carries on, the United States ultimately wouldn't even factor into it. And that's really what you're seeing this week. You're seeing the United States as a non-factor, a non-player. Well, we send a few hundred to protect this, this embassy, this palace that was constructed over there on the hope that Iraq would stabilize and we could have the, our biggest embassy in the world there. Well, now that's in danger. Now we're sending over uh, troops just to protect that facility with all of its equipment. Who knows what all's in there? That puts a lot of American lives at danger, for sure. This is a quote we had in the trumpet back in 2003, right at the outset of the war in Iraq. It says, now that Iraq has been taken out of the picture, Iran is even closer to becoming the reigning king of the Middle East. It may seem shocking given the U.S. presence in the region right now. That's back in 2003, remember. But prophecy indicates that in pursuit of its goal, Iran will probably take over Iraq. At least it will have a heavy influence over the Iraqi people. Well, in recent years, you've seen that heavy influence as that Shiite government was installed, basically a puppet regime of Iran. And now you're seeing the military take charge. I mean, what's happened basically this week is Iran has invaded Iraq. That's what's happening. 
as they send troops across the border to protect their Shiite brethren. It's an invasion. And it has the support of America. America's probably going to provide some kind of air power, I suppose. Who knows? But what a development, as I said. Who would have thought that this could have even happened a few weeks ago? And now we're seeing it happen. Now it's unfolding. It's incredible what's happening. Leviticus 26 here in verse 20, it says, And your strength shall be spent in vain, and your land shall uh, not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. See, the strength of the United States is being spent in vain. The verse previous to that talks about our, our power, the, the will, the pride in our power being broken. We've read that scripture to you many times. Here it says your strength would be spent in vain. Look at all of the lives, the equipment, the money, everything that we spent in Iraq for 10 years. And it just goes up in smoke. In one week, it's gone. It's over. What do you, I mean, what does the United States have to show for this, this effort in Iraq and in Afghanistan to, to soon follow? Now, like I did last week. I mean, it's important that we step back and see the bigger picture here of what's happening and, and happening on a grand scale. I focused more on the Middle East and the North African region last week. But think about these developments in terms of what's happened to America in recent months. This is from an article Brett Stevens wrote at uh, the Wall Street Journal, June 16th, just the other day. And he asked, this is at the top of his article, was it only 10 months ago that President Obama capitulated on Syria? Was that just 10 months ago? He says, and eight months ago that we learned he had no idea the U.S. eavesdropped on Angela Merkel? It says, and seven months ago that his administration struck its disastrous interim nuclear deal with Tehran? And four months ago that Chuck Hagel announced that the United States Army would be cut to numbers not seen since the 1930s? I mean, are all these things really happening? It goes on and says, and three months ago that Russia seized Crimea, and two months ago that John Kerry's Israel, Israeli-Palestinian peace effort sputtered into the void. He says, and last month that Mr. Obama announced a timetable for total withdrawal from Afghanistan, a strategy whose predictable effects can now be seen in Iraq. You get the idea of what he's trying to say. What about the pace of these events, really? What about the pace of all these devastating events for the United States? It says here, finally, even the Bergdahl deal of yesterweek is starting to feel like ancient history. Like geese, Americans are being forced to swallow foreign policy fiascos at a rate faster than we can possibly chew, much less digest. I mean, have you ever seen anything like this? These kinds of events just happening rapid fire, one after another, it's, it's weekly now. That's what he's saying. It makes the Bergdahl affair seem like it was ancient history. One final quote from Mr. Stevens' article. It says, on Thursday, Russian tanks rolled across the border into eastern Ukraine. On Saturday, Russian separatists downed a Ukrainian transport jet, murdering 49 people. On Monday, Moscow stopped delivering gas to Kiev. This is just in the last week, and that's in Ukraine. Hasn't even gotten any headlines. It says, all this is part of the Kremlin's ongoing stealth invasion and subjugation of its neighbor. And all of this barely made the news. John Kerry phoned Moscow to express his strong concern. Concern, mind you, not condemnation. That's all that we have to offer anymore is concern as we just let these events explode in front of us. Has America's power, has the will of America's power been broken? Has the pride in its power been broken? Has America's strength been spent in vain? And what about the pace of these events? As I mentioned, I mean, this news in the Ukraine, it hasn't even really made headlines because of all that's happening elsewhere. Pretty remarkable when you think of it. Verse 21 here says, And if you will walk contrary unto me, 
and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon, upon you according to your sins. God is giving a strong warning to the people of Manasseh, the descendants of Manasseh today being the United States of America, to Ephraim, the British people. He's giving a strong warning saying, look, the intensity and the pace, it's only going to increase unless we look at ourselves. Of course, really, we've passed the point of no return. Let me just take you to one final scripture. This is in uh, the book of 2 Peter over in the New Testament. 2 Peter chapter 3. It's easy to look at what's happening in Iraq and say, wow, that nation has just collapsed because of what you see happening on the streets. But if you look at the pace of the events from America's perspective, it's easy to conclude that America is the nation that's collapsing. It's going to impact a lot more nations than that little nation of Iraq. Is it really just eight months ago that such and such happened, or five months ago, or last week? And we move on to the next disaster, the next foreign policy uh, fiasco. This is 2 Peter 3 and verse 12. It says, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. I didn't have time to put this scripture in the slides, but if you look in the margin there, this is 2 Peter 3, 12, looking for and hastening the coming of Jesus Christ, in other words. And when you look at the way events are unfolding, there can be no doubt that time is racing along. As you see the collapse of the United States, the Middle East going up in flames, Putin on the march in Ukraine and elsewhere, China on the rise, the alliance between Russia and China forming. How much longer before the Daniel 8 man appears in Europe? Think about the pace. It's hard to imagine it getting much worse or things moving much faster from a prophetic standpoint, but it will. It will get worse in the short run, and prophecies are about to unfold at an even faster pace. This is our uh, e-book that I referred you to a couple of weeks ago, America's 4,000-year-old history. You can go to thetrumpet.com to locate this. We'll put a link uh, for this particular e-book underneath this video so that you can secure your copy. In order to get one, you need to uh, create an account um, at thetrumpet.com, but that's completely free. It's free of charge. Uh, and if you go and create an account today, then you can download your copy of America's 4,000-year-old history. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on The Trumpet Daily.